And I'm going to read a little introduction for Maria that she wrote. That's amazing. That just that was great. Um, and and then Maria will present for us her work, and then we'll take a little break, and then we'll um, come back and we'll do the projects and give feedback. Okay, so we are so excited to welcome Maria Lucio tonight for our class. She's an interdisciplinary artist, writer, performer, educator, and witch from Puerto Rico based in Los Angeles. Um, a trained actor, singer, and physical performer who studied at Tisch and MOU and Moscow Art Theater, as well as Cal Arts for her MFA. She allows amateur and do-it-yourself aesthetics to disturb established modes of theatrical performance, creating space for the transformation of embodied research into ritual acts of decolonization. Her work has taken the form of dinners, lectures, walking tours, videos, stage shows, and game nights. Her full-length solo works unravel timelines embedded with precise historical reenactment into musical extravaganzas including Brandenburg Gate, The American Hits at PAM, and Con la Boca es un Bame at Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. Her collaborative practice with Sally Merkel Emotional Labor Company weaves popular culture and academic inquiry into nonlinear transgressive studies of girlhood, as in our so-called sleepover or Freud and Young Crash 1995 through a Ouija board, which was performed at the LAX Festival, and creates transformative ritual via playful entertainment, as in the Commons digital series and the iterative Witch's Cabaret, We Put a Spell on You at Machine Project's Mystery Theater, and also at Witch House at CalArts, as well as Love Spells at Mass on Fig and Casting into the Unknown and the Graveyard Shift, which were both presented via live stream. As a performer, she has collaborated with artists Carolina Caicedo, Daniel Dean, Harry Dodge, Lizzie Fitch and Ryan Chakart, and Sean Gr Gratton, Amy Howden Chapman, Zoe, I, I hope I say it right, Zoe Aja Moore, Zoe Aja Moore, Aja Moore, Tyler Matthew Oyer, Monica Rodriguez, and Gray, Greg Wohead. And I have had the pleasure of knowing Maria for several years through uh, intermingle performance circles in Los Angeles. And I've gotten to know her in the capacity of being a performer, but also a spiritual practitioner. And so I'm very excited that she can bring together so many different worlds and so many different modes of performance and social interaction into uh, the work that she's presenting for us today. So let's unmute ourselves and give a warm welcome to Maria. Thank you. I needed that, that clapping in, um, in magical practice. Collapse can be a way of um, dispersing any built up energy that is stagnant. So like any sense of like anticipation nerves that I'm feeling right now, the collapse was like a really good way of just like moving the energy around. Um, well, so as Lex said, today is my birthday and I feel like birthdays are a really funny time travel portal that happens where you get in touch with like a lot of people from different times in your life and maybe like your family sends you some photos of like past selves. Um, so I think birthdays exist in this very liminal space. Um, and with that in mind, I will say that maybe I'm kind of like living in the spiral today. So all of my attempts at like giving you a linear and organized presentation might go out the window. So we'll see. Um, so I started as an actor and then Actually, in one of my performance studies classes at NYU, I had this class called Postmodern Dramaturgy with um, Marianne Weems and Norman Frisch, who were two of the Wooster Group dramaturgs. And I was a sophomore in college. And I just didn't know 
all of that world of performance existed um, coming from a musical theater background and then going into the acting studio that David Mamet founded, which was very into like this kind of like straight white dude, like acting, I'm trying to convince you, I'm trying to convince you. Um, and really like uninspiring material I found. All of a sudden I was just like, oh my God, like the Wooster group and like Reza Abdo and like all of these performance makers that are not taking the conventions of theater for granted. Um, and I think especially as someone that I spent the majority of my undergraduate acting studies getting rid of my accent um, because I was coming from Puerto Rico and I was like, well, I don't want to get typecast. I want to play all sorts of roles. So I'm going to like really focus on my speech classes and, and be able to achieve this like neutral actor speech pattern. And the thing that I've realized since then is that there is no neutral. There is no neutral when it comes to like the white gallery space or the like traditional transatlantic acting voice that they teach most people in acting school. Um, and so what I realized after some time is that I actually was training myself to sound white. And that is something that's very hard to undo because this is my natural voice and cadence in English because it's the only one I know. And so I've slowly tried to like untangle some of the things that I've built upon it, but it's a lifelong process. And so I think when it comes to making performance, and this is true of my performances even before I actually had a foundational developed magic practice. I think performances, artworks in general are spells. And I'll define a spell as articulation of a desire and creating the specificity of language to turn that into an intention. Then you gather your materials and by materials, um, I mean your literal object, tangible materials, or I mean your voice, the demeanor of your voice, the, the way that you are um, engaging with your body, the way that you address the audience directly or indirectly, whether you are including a fourth wall in your performance, all of these things are your spell ingredients. And so you've articulated your desire into an intention, then you are going to imbue all of your materials with this intention and it's a process of aligning all of the components that you're using with this intention and so then the acting of the performance or the making of the sculpture or whatever it is that you're doing is the ritualization and it's a moment of hyper focus and a shift of energy into like a liminal space. So this threshold destabilization between stages or, of something, you are heightening the experience of being and interacting with these objects and enacting these objects as a means to create a shift. Um, and whether you achieve your desired outcome or not is kind of, I mean, at that point, it almost gets translated into something unknowable and ununderstandable because my experience of receiving a performance as an audience member 
is going to be completely different from the person next to me because my lived experiences and my relationships to these references are going to be completely different to the person next to me. Um, and so I think a lot of my performances are rituals as a way of decolonizing myself and then opens up the spell to um, maybe a process of, or like the availability to unlearn and deprogram from the audience perspective by stacking a lot of different references. Um, I will show you some images because this might be sounding a little bit vague. Uh, let me see. Okay, so the first kind of body of work that I made were these performances where I would pretend or like put on the character of George Washington um, to unpack some of the like consensus reality around what America is and its history. Um, and it was a process of understanding for myself, but also a kind of a sharing of an experience in a way that could put a text like the constitution and have us all listen to it with space to maybe create a more spacious relationship to what the text might mean and how it might shift its meaning when you take it out of its historical context. So I did this performance and you can see the bottom two left images um, where I did a walking tour of Mount Washington in Los Angeles. And I did a walking tour where I read through the entire constitution and all the sites where I stopped were either permanent sites like the Southwest Museum. Um, and some of them were impermanent sites like this tumbleweed that I'm reading an article to or a deflated bal balloon on the side of the road. Um, there's a lot of real estate signs because it's very hot real estate properties up there. Um, a lot of construction and because it's up on the hills, it has this kind of, um, the geography of exclusiveness. And so there's not a lot of sidewalks there. Um, and so I think what the performance was trying to achieve was to create some space around the ideas that the founding fathers put into paper um, and put them in a location where space is not, like geographical space is not infinite, that it's not like we just have all this land that we can do whatever we want with. Um, that there's a literal stacking of people and of um, habitats um, and really being able to question ideas around public and private spaces, the way that public and private space was conceived then and how it's changed now um, and continues to change. Um, and something that I employ in a lot of these performances, and especially, it's especially true of the George Washington performances, um, I use this character that is myself, but is 
maybe like a subtle clown version of myself where I really invest in investigating the aspects of my demeanor that are like the expressions of my colonized body. And so maybe if I was like taking you on a talking tour, it's like my voice is just slightly higher than it would be normally. And maybe I take up space in a slightly smaller way. Maybe I sound like a little bit less sure of things. Um, it's this kind of hyper feminized form of a dress. And after a while, you kind of stop paying attention to it. And so this host becomes the container for these, in the example of these um, works, for these authoritative male voices. And I'm gonna continue to use the term male and female. And sometimes I mean that in a gendered way. And sometimes I mean that in the kind of energetic way of female, like as far as like mystical understandings of male and female energies, female as being receptive and male as being active. Um, and so it's a way to destabilize the authority of these voices and these texts um, to listen to them in a different way because they're coming from a different kind of voice and a different kind of body. Um, they're not assuming power and they're not assuming their, their right to take up space. Um, so I kind of, I, I try to play with myself as the conduit of information and play with the, the like importance that that information might be, might be taking up in the narrative. Uh, when I use multiple references, my goal is always to achieve a non-hierarchical presentation of the material so that things like the constitution, for example, do not gain more importance than like a gif that I found about something that is like adjacent thematically inside of the performance. Um, So Brandenburg Gate was a solo work that I made um, that was looking at this timeline of US American presidential visits to Berlin. And those four visits were Kennedy, Reagan, Clinton, and Obama. And so I created this timeline that was looking at these speeches and what these speeches were saying in a foreign site, but that also was a very specific and um, a very specific contained site because they all spoke in front of the Brandenburg Gate, which at different times in history was divided by the wall that divided East and West Berlin. And so I looked at these speeches as a kind of truncated timeline of policy rhetoric from the 60s to the present. I made this performance in 2016 um, during the primaries. And then I looked at what the number one hits were in the States on the days that these performances, I mean, 
well, yeah, performances, <laughs> these speeches took place um, to see if they kind of matched what the, or like what they, what they had to echo about what these heads of state were saying about the United States to the world from a foreign site. So there's some really interesting couplings that happened um, when Reagan gives his very famous Gorbachev, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The number one song was You Just Keep Me Hanging On by Kim Wilde, cover of the Supremes actually. Um, when the wall comes down, the number one song is Listen to Your Heart. When Obama speaks, and I wanna give a little bit more context, what is happening underneath this very friendly official visit where he is um, having a very loving, cordial external friendship with Angela Merkel, what's happening underneath is that her phone is being tapped. And this is the year where Snowden leaks the files um, from the NSA. So, and the number one song was Blurred Lines. <laughs> um, so there's just this kind of playful, um, vibe that surrounds all of these like declarations. Clinton talking about free trade. Um, yeah, and so something that can happen in a performance like this is that you get very comfortable. You know, I make sure I try to be a very good host in, in all my work, right? So maybe you're sitting on a very comfortable throw pillow with the American flag on it and you are drinking a Budweiser and like talking to your friends. And I'm just like up here chit chatting with everyone. And without you really knowing when it happened, like the performance just kind of starts and I just start talking about like, you know, like when Kennedy went in, there was like this song and it was like weird because it was a Japanese song about like a soldier that was like really not happy about the war. And, but then like all the American radio hosts like didn't know um, how to pronounce it. So they just started calling it like sukiyaki because that was like the name of the dish that was like popular, I guess, or whatever that like people could know, like people could say. And, you know, I'm like just walking through like giving you facts and giving you information and then you know, there's like all the materials are there to signify. It's like, okay, I have like some rolls of paper. These rolls of paper represent the gate. This roll of paper represents the wall. When the wall comes down, I'll rip it up, you know, and then it'll, the wall will be gone. And we'll just kind of like truncate history in this really like non-precious way, right? And so then maybe we get to the part of the performance where like Obama's gonna do, do his talk at Brandenburg Gate. Um, and he says some really nice things about Angela Merkel. And then I'm gonna be like, okay, so then, you know, then he gives the speech and maybe I like put on a tie that's the same color. And you know, I'll probably not be wearing these earrings. Um, and so, uh, uh, I haven't done this in a few years, so <clears throat> I don't know how good my Obama voice is going to be, but, uh, uh, 
Chancellor Merkel mentioned that we mark the anniversary of uh, President John F. Kennedy's stirring defense of freedom uh, embodied in the people of this great city. Uh, his pledge of solidarity, uh, Ich bin ein Berliner, uh, echoes through the ages. But that's not all that he said that day. Let's remember is the challenge that he issued to the crowd before him. Let me ask you, he said to those Berliners, let me ask you to lift your eyes beyond the dangers of today and beyond the freedom merely of the city. Look, he said, to the day of peace with justice, beyond yourselves and ourselves to all mankind. So if this speech keeps going long enough, maybe the separation in your brain that's happening between what you know Obama to sound like and what you know me to sound like starts to blur. And maybe we create a kind of liminal space where I am me and I am channeling Obama and based on the information in which that we are receiving in this space, we can hear these words in a way that complicates their intent, original intended meaning. Um, you know, and maybe later I probably move this background, like get rid of it. And like, there's like this other moment of like another shift for the space. It's like the space, then we can see it in a different way. So maybe we have something unfamiliar to the site that we have been exploring. So that the space that we're stacking starts, the edges start to bleed and the edges start to blur. And so maybe his speech can exist next to a song, for example. So let's see if we can get YouTube to work for me here. Can get really close to you. You can look into your eyes. Now here you go again. You say you want your freedom. Well, who am I to keep you down? It's only right that you should play the way you feel it. Listen carefully to the sound of your loneliness like a heartbeat drives you mad. To the stillness of your memories and what you have and what you lost. And what you have, and what you lost. Oh, thunder only happens when it's raining. Players only love you when they're playing. Say women, 
And so maybe after that, if I finish, if I continue on with Obama's speech, and I say that we may no longer live in fear of global annihilation, but so long as nuclear weapons exist, we are not truly safe. We may strike blows against terrorist networks, but if we ignore the instability and intolerance that fuels extremism, our own freedom will eventually be endangered. We may enjoy a standard of living that is the envy of the world, but so long as hundreds of millions endure the agony of an empty stomach or the anguish of unemployment, we're not truly prosperous. And so this is like a very compressed version of what like a build might be. Um, and, and these, the cycle kind of repeats over and over again. And so the hope is that, you know, the structure, if the timeline is a line, then the events around the timeline that are the like non-authoritative modes of accounting for truth and for history, maybe they're creating a spiral around, I guess the spiral will go this way, around the timeline and so then what you get is this like conglomeration of things. And as far as a process of decolonizing or ritual towards decolonization, the approach is to deprioritize, to deprioritize consensus reality. Um, and I, and I, and I don't mean that there's no, like, I, I don't want to like get into like alternative facts because that's like not the path that I'm like interested in going down. Um, I'm more interested in giving, um, giving the, giving, space and ear and presence to voices and accounts that are marginalized. Um, and to come to a different understanding of the information, which I, at this point I'm repeating myself, but so the next thing I want to show you guys is this performance called Con la boca es un mame, which was another timeline. This time it was a timeline of Puerto Rico from 1898 when it was occupied by the United States to the present at that time, uh, which was 2017. Um, and this one was more personal because this is where I'm from. And so for me, it was also a process of displacing nostalgia and like the symbols of nostalgia and like really examining them inside of the context of uh, unknown histories and stories of oppression, kind of to try to um, decompress and investigate some of the stereotypes around Puerto Ricans, stereotypes that I had of Puerto Ricans in the diaspora as someone who like lived in the island until I graduated from high school, which I later came to realize was a total privilege because most of the people that left, left because there were not enough resources. Um, and so unpacking some of like my personal history with the history of the occupation, um, looking at the 
cultural content that is being produced from this facade of harmony as Americanized Latin Americans. Um, as Latin Americans with a US passport, separating the story of the immigrant with the one of the migrant um, and the role that like capitalism and consumption and like the buying of the island and the selling of the colony back to the Puerto Ricans uh, that process. And so again, it was a lot, there were speech, reenacted speeches, there were some songs, there was some unpacking of uh, cultural content. This performance I made, um, I made a full Puerto Rican dinner for everybody that came. So they came in with food. They were given like uh, rum shots. Um, and so I wanna go back to this idea of the host because I think that like, if we really look at the meanings of the word host, we have, yeah, someone that is like inviting you into an experience someone who's inviting you into a space. You can also look at host as a computer inside of a network, which is like mediating information, like the threshold, again, speaking of liminality. The body as host, the body as a host that can um, be occupied, be invaded, be colonized, also the body as a host that can inhabit other characters, other spirits, other personalities. Um, something really interesting about the trans mediums of the spiritual event is that they were women in a society that, well, devalued the voices of women, maybe even more than now. Um, and they use this experience of mediumship to be able to channel spirits that were speaking to social justice um, issues. So they were talking about abolitionism and they were talking about um, giving women the right to vote. Um, and so in a way it's like whether or not they were actually being possessed or actually channeling spirits to me is less important. And the thing that's more, more interesting is the fact that they are using their body as a host, their body as a site for these ideas to be expressed in a time and in a site where those ideas are not being respected coming from their bodies. Um, and yeah, what are the agreements that you come into, like what are the agreements that you strike with someone as you walk into their house? What is your responsibility um, when you are inviting people to your space? Like how do you create the conditions for your imbued spell materials to like really be able to land and to communicate and what are the ethics of that too you know how are you are you making your audience feel feel safe if not why um is there consent uh, yeah, those are the things I'm mostly interested in. I think I'm good to stop talking about myself now. Are you sure? Cause it's so good. 
<laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like I have, I guess I will mention, I have a collaborative practice with my friend, Sally Merkel. And we, we like learned witchcraft together as research for a project. And then we like actually just were like, oh no, but now we're like actually witches. Um, and so our work together is more overtly like art as spell. Um, we have a web series that features a lot of like art witches. And so it's more about this kind of like, the, what is the prism, you know? Cause like magic is not a monolith either. So there's like lots of different traditions, practices and points of view also based on like who you are, where you come from, what your lived experience is. So, I mean, we, I guess that is also another sense in which we like really treat hosting very seriously because it's about creating modes of, of production that are aligned with the, like the ethics of the world we wanna see. So when we film the web series, everyone gets paid the same. Um, we have we have a non-hierarchical approach to being on set. Um, everybody checks, like we all check in at the beginning, like if people need something. Um, we also have an active glossary of um, terms for filming. So filming language is super militarized, right? You have shoot, you have hit your mark, you have all of these things. So we really actively try to find different language so that we're not employing military language when we film. So we say film, we say find your place. Um, there's other things that are escaping my mind right now, but I guess th that was something that I think was important for me to say that I think the way in which you make things um, is also just as important as like the thing that you're making. And so with all of my work that I shared with you, a, a big part of it was this like DIY aspect. And I was like, all of the media was always being controlled by me from the stage. Um, I wanted to make it really transparent, like where things are coming from. Um, you know, I, I taught myself how to edit. So I had control like over the means of production, basically. A big blind spot though that I had, oh, blind spot, that's an ableist term. I just realized that as I was saying it to you, uh, apologies. Um, but something that I had to realize is like a lot of those performances, a lot of the like hand props and like crap that was getting pulled out of everywhere was just like stuff that I, I mean, I wasn't gonna make it myself. So I just like bought it on Amazon. And now I'm like, okay, well, we should stop buying things from Amazon that I put in the performances. So some of the, some of the, my thoughts around making things. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Maria. Do you mind if I show the trailer from season two of The Commons? Oh no, please. Okay. Um, so I've seen a few episodes of The Commons and how many episodes are there in season one and season two? I think there's 13 episodes total, which was intentional, but I think it's six, no, it's, it's five and eight. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm gonna show uh, the trailer. Maybe you could talk a little bit about collaboration mm -hmm. and how that meets up with the idea of like host or does that, you know, change, change the nature of the host. Um, so I'll play this. Oh, my God. 
Yeah, hosting and collaboration. I think a lot changed between seasons one and season two. Season one was definitely like all scripted, all came from me and Merkel. Um, and as our magic community expanded and we became more aware of other practices, other practitioners, other, other people that were also existing in this like space of art and magic um we decided that what we wanted to do was to kind of host more of those points of view and so when season two came around we had the same characters and we kept some of the segments so season one was the same performers playing in different segments so it was kind of like the original idea was it's like it's like sesame street meets the view um, and so we had a segment like the round table where like people are talking, the four witches are talking about ideas and it, we filmed it right after, um, the current president leaving the white house became elected. And so we were kind of, these witches exist in a different dimension from our reality, which in the show we call, this is called the bound world. And they exist in like a slightly more magical uh, matriarchal reality um, but they were what we tried to do was to kind of write some of these ideas around um, mutual aid resistance like these ways of of organizing um, ways of taking care of ourselves like how magic can be a form of power and a balm and uh, a like a community building endeavor. Um, so when season two came around, what we did was we just invited a bunch of rad witches, like mystics and weirdos to create content. And some of them we helped to produce people that like didn't necessarily have a background in video. So we would they would tell us what they wanted to make and then we would just kind of like provide the space and the facilities for it and then some people like edgar fabian frias who is like an amazing video spell casting art which just sent us a full complete like two video two spells two packages video done um and so we we just kind of slotted it all in and I know you guys um, were watching some Wooster Group uh, content. And one of the first things that like really kind of blew my mind about the Wooster Group when I was first exposed to them is like, there's this quote of uh, Liz LeCompte talking about how she started making art in the age of remote control like before you used to have to get up and switch the channel. So you would flip, switch the channel less frequently. Um, but like this power of just being able to like switch and just like have be consumed by like lots of different things at the same time. And this like piling up of different um, images and that create their own micro new cosm of, of, of meaning. Um, that is something that I am always like super fascinated by. And that was kind of one of the, the filters through which the season was made. It was just about like, we like your shit. Like how, what can we do to host you? Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? More questions for Maria? Any questions? I have a question. Um, so I just want to hear more about like your, do you frame it as like magic practice? I'm not sure the exact, okay. Um, and how that, if at all extends like to your 
personal life, how it transformed your life and what, um, like, do you want more people to come into this or do you kind of, do you know what I'm saying? Like, is the goal to try to just spread your own message or like invite people into that community? Like, how has it influenced your intent? Oh yeah, interesting. Okay, so yeah, I'm like a fully practicing witch. Um, and like I mentioned before, my my magic practice came out of my art practice. And then the more I have gotten into it, the more I've realized that a lot of what I was doing before was using the similar principles. Um, and so what magic kind of gave me, gave me as far as the, my art practice was, uh, more, more information, like a kind of a broader scope with which to articulate and also um, like engaging with like the ethics of magic practice and art making and like what you are putting out in the world. Um, and there's lots of different traditions and lots of different points of view. My what I have arrived at and a lot of it influenced by like one of my teachers is like, I, I personally don't do things like hexes or bindings or things. I, I, I try to like not do, not make magic that inhibits other people's free will. Um, I try to engage in magic that either like some of the work that I share with you guys like removes like uncast spells that like society ha have imposed on us or creation magic, which the commons is more aligned with that. It's more about like envisioning possible worlds. Um, I mean, magic has been like amazing in my life. I don't, uh, I'm not trying to like, convert people for me it's just been like a really useful tool and I think it it gives me like a really good framework from which to ask questions as I'm approaching like an art process um like I have the project that I'm working on right now is it exists as a like a hundred page manuscript right now but it has different it has like some it has some screenplay formatting and it has some like performance prompt formatting and it has some play script formatting um and a lot of just archive found found text um and it's a it's like it's a sci-fi project that is actually like an extension of Sumame because after that project like so many things have happened between Hurricane Maria and um like ousting Ricky Rosselló and like all of this stuff that I felt like my position as a as an outsider like the timeline like didn't really work for me and like I didn't feel like I had ownership over that timeline anymore and so what I started doing was like writing from a future 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 and I bring this into the conversation about magic because this this work is really concerned with um ancestors and descendants and my understanding of ancestors and descendants is like it is not like blood it is it is not biological um ancestors or descendants necessarily but the idea that you can follow lineages and start lineages through the actions that you make in your life or your the work that you make all of that stuff um so someone whose lineage i really um like align myself with is octavia butler's and so to your question of magical practice like i have three altars in my house i have one in my bedroom that's like kind of like my personal i wake up and i'm like this is my protection this is like my vibe for today i put out some water i light some incense whatever i went in the living room that's like the family one it's like to the ancestors to like the the people that might need some like uh 
generational healing, whatever. And then I have one next to my desk. I'm gonna show you guys my desk. It's a big mess right now, but um, so I have this mini altar here. This is like my art altar, my work altar. And so I have Octavia here and I always put out coffee for her like every day. I don't know if you can see it. I put out coffee for her every day. And that's kind of like, whether or not Octavia is like a spirit that is like communicating with me, it's like, I'm not like really interested in asking that question. But what it does for me is that I'm invested in some seeds that like of ideas that Octavia has planted. And so in my daily devotion to her and those ideas, I have a kind of path of communication in which I am turning those ideas over and thinking about like how I am taking those ideas, like what it is about, which of those seeds am I going to sow? And so with this project, it's um, trying to like be like really, succinct about it but it's basically like one of my earth is like can't handle so many people so a lot of people go and like live elsewhere in space and there's like a colony of people from the Puerto Rican diaspora that are also training in like mystical practices around sentience of like objects and animals and things and like their whole goal is to like once the earth can handle more humanity they can go back with the goal of being stewards for the earth and having all these practices of communication to like best serve. Um, and so the project is the voyage back of the first person coming back who is my super, super future, like many, many, many thousands of years in the future, my descendant going back to earth and the only person that they talk to is the computer's AI, the, the ship's AI, which is built out of my Mireya's memory archive from the time on earth. So it's kind of this like collection of speculative writing from, from our time that is looking at the ways in which humanity can evolve and like the way in which like mysticism and magic intersects with um like human futurism so i'm less interested in maybe like technological advancements and more interested in like the body as a site of technological advancement and the soul um yeah so that's that project which is like that project for me is just like ancestral magic, totally woven. Like, even if I don't work on it in one day, like I'm still putting out my coffee for Octavia. Um, that's just like an ongoing conversation. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I think it's very impressive to like hear about this type of practice. I think a lot of people would bring like skepticism to and to be able to, you know, retain that um, conviction. And also the fact that it's so gendered, I think is also very interesting. Like the history of it is so gendered and like has such a negative connotation, so much fear surrounding it. I think it's really inspiring. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. I have a question about something you mentioned about establishing consent within your work. And so I was just wondering like what consent looks for you like for you when you're doing artistic practice and when you're performing and things like that and sort of like what ways you either do or do, like how you establish consent with an audience because I think that's a really interesting idea and so I just love to hear more about like how that works its way into your practice and how you think about that when you're creating art. Mm -hmm. So I think that I think that there's like a layer to the like consent practice that I employ with an audience that 
is a little bit problematic because there's it's like creating an energy or a vibe in which people feel like I'm checking in with you constantly so that you might so that you feel okay to stop things but that's also based on me having an assumption that I'm making you feel safe right and so I haven't figured out how to be the one orchestrating and talking to a room of like, you know, 50, 60 people and like make sure that I have consent from every single person. But what I try to do is to kind of like gently go from one thing to the other to ease people into like a, an energetic shift for example to say just to i guess to create an environment of like can can we move on did everybody finish reading this thing like give content warnings um make space for questions and for disruption yeah i guess it's it's mainly around creating an environment in which i'm i'm leading this thing but i'm not in charge of you um i'm not an authority so that's that's been like how I've tried to navigate it. I mean, I've definitely had a lot more success in the kind of production process around things where everyone is, you know, like behind the scenes, we're all getting asked, is everyone okay with this? Like this is what's going to happen next? Does anybody have, you know, that that seems a lot well, not that it's easy because that even that has taken a lot of trial and error. Like Merkel and I, you know, we and we're not like the most efficient at it, but like the only way we've figured out the last two cabarets that we did were via Zoom and we were basically hosting a bunch of other performers. And so for rehearsals, the only way to make sure that we're creating a space of consent and where people feel comfortable is we need to have a meeting before so we can like organize the structure in which people can feel safe. Then we have the rehearsal or the meeting and then we have a meeting after where we like debrief about what just happened and like find better practices for the next time. So our way right now is incredibly time consuming, but it's like the only way we figured out how to like do, do like due diligence for everyone. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a question. Um, so much of what you covered and all the work that you've done covers so many different topics from like so many different angles and you're really pushing the audiences to see the, your questions in like a, a more accurate fullness and like a more dimensional and more reflective of like reality. How do you manage all these all these questions, all these ways that you want your audience to be engaging with what you're performing and like just dealing with the density of that. How do you, you know, a minute is still a minute. Like how do you cap, how do you work to like get all of these things funneled in a way that they're communicating and also still like being expansive to the audience as well? Does it just mean that you just create more work over more time or is there like sort of a, mindset or framework that you have to help you sort of deal with those equations yeah i mean it i i research things for a very long time um and then i start putting them together um slowly and then thankfully with a lot of these projects i've just gotten an opportunity and it's like oh hey do you want to whatever this thing that you've been talking to me about like do you want to do something in a month and then it's like okay and then i just have to like get it all get it all in um 
But I think like one really important organizing principle for me is like joy and fun. And even if it's like really dense, like kind of bummer material in a lot of cases to just like have a sense of like, like what's the dance that I'm doing with this thing? And like, what is the way in which this is like really fun for me to work on? And it, what is the way in which this feels like something I want to work on and not like, I'm just like super overwhelmed and I can't deal with this. So like with this current project that I'm working on, the scope of research is just so massive. Like I could, I literally have like a hundred books that are just in different stacks that are the things that I'm referencing. And this is where like actually magical practice like really came to save the day for like fun and joy and laughter. And I was like, you know, I read tarot and I just shuffle cards and I'll just pull out a card. And like, that's the card that I pulled and that's the card that we talk about. So I've, what I've started doing is just being like, this, these are the four books that I'm gonna like do divination with. And I'll just like flip through and get to a page and like get a quote. And it's like, that's the quote that I'm engaging with today. And if it sparks something else and I need to look for something else in that book, but it's like, I can't read all those books. I mean, I can, but then I can't, I'm not gonna be doing anything else that's like fun and exciting. So like, that's what I do. And sometimes things just like stay for a long time. I have this project, actually the first project that I made with Merkel. Um, oh, here, I can show you really quickly. I, I actually do have images from this. Um, the, um, our so-called sleepover or Freud and Young Crush 1995 through a Ouija board. When I was in college, I got obsessed with Freud and Jung's letters to each other. You can find them in a book. They read like teen, teen caddy, like jealousy fights. They're amazing. And they're like talking about female hysteria in this way. And then they're just being like, oh, well, you said that in your last letter, but actually like, I feel, you know, they're, they're being teenage, they're being like stereotypical teenage girls fighting. Um, and I was just like, I just want to do something with these letters and like the collective unconscious and like something, 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 something. And for years, my draft, my edit of those letters just like went from like computer to computer. And then, and then Merkel and I just started working on this like teen, like 90s teen, like fantasy thing where we're like oh we can like be ourselves then and like unpack all of the like the patriarchy that's like inherent in teen in like girl teenhood um and then the letters came back and it was like kind of a perfect marriage so these like teenage versions of ourselves got possessed through the Ouija board by Freud and Jung and we like were having these fights that were getting pulled from scenes from my so-called life and then we we're having these fights being possessed by these like men talking about female hysteria um and so like I don't know fun is a really good organizing principle for like how to make things talk to each other I think I mean you know my medium is mainly performance. Like clearly I just, I, I, I like fun. Um, Maria, this has been so amazing. And one moment that I really enjoyed is when you were talking about, um, de hierarchizing taking take, making things non-hierarchical and then returning to them to create this spiral around around like a vector that's actually the truth but it's like we don't see the vector that has the gravitational force in it and it was so nice to hear you describe that because I remember like some years ago, we were talking just about life and you described the spiral motion to me. And that has always stuck with me, this idea of things moving forward, but around at the mm -hmm. same time. Um, I love that moment. Uh, I, 
my question is about another uh, something else that you had said to me once that stuck with me for a long time that was about your move from being like an actor in like theater, film or TV roles and pursuing acting in that way to being an artist and creating performances and working in a more expanded field. And I, I remember our conversation was just about like being typecast, um, but very specifically the frustration of only being be like just being cast in the way that others see you mm -hmm. and for some reason it radically changed the way that I thought about what acting is in like an the industrial sense um and what type casting is because we all know it exists but that there was something about the way that you had said it, it blew my mind. Up until that point, I had still had these kind of like lingering dreams of like acting in, in the industry of acting and realizing like, yes, that's so true. It, it would be difficult maybe for a, you know, many directors or many production teams to conceptualize you or I or anybody as anything else other than the roles that they have been assigned to. Um, and that conversation has always stuck with me. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about just like the transition that you made from one kind of world into another, but then also because I know you do act like in, in, you know, well, like, I, what would be the word? Like in a kind of more like mainstream, because I, I feel like I, I saw you in like a trailer <laughs> for something. I can't remember. I mean, it was like a Janixa Bravo film or a short film or something. Can you talk about those different worlds and moving between them and just yeah, how it has been to navigate those different spaces for you? Yeah, I mean, I guess, so I went to CalArts for my MFA in theater. And the reason I went back to get another degree in the same thing is because I wanted to move away from just being an actor to being an actor who made performance. And at CalArts, I started hanging out with like Danielle and Tyler and like all the art kids and they were like making some like really weirdo performances and I was like I mean this is cool but like have you tried doing this with like people that like actually know how to fucking perform and are not just like you know um which is a it's valid I mean this is and I think this is like where my interest like really sparked it's just like oh like you don't have to only act like this but also it helps if you can like do more than like just like whispering into like your index card or whatever. So I got really excited about making work and about collaborating with people that had like a much more developed like sense of the art that they were making. So I started performing in their work and then I also started developing my work At the end of CalArts, all the actors have to do this like show industry showcase and I got a commercial agent out of it. And this hilarious thing happened where I signed with my commercial agent. I had also done this like weird program through um, Walt Disney Imagineering where I ended up getting a job as an Imagineer. So it was like working on like designing interactive experiences for the parks which was like a total mind fuck because I was like I do not want to be a part of this culture but also they're paying me really well and like I'm having some interesting conversations and then having just signed with a commercial agent that I never called back 
I just, I signed and then I never called them back because I was like, but like, what if I like, I just want to keep making like my weird performance. Like I had, I made this performance where I was like, I did like an impersonation, but not as one of the presidents. I was like, Osama bin Laden singing Nancy Sinatra's Bang Bang like as a love letter to the US government for like having given Afghanistan arms and then, you know, going to war with them. So it was like making all this weird stuff. And I was like, I don't want to be your friendly Latina friend selling you tampons on TV because that's like, who's gonna take me seriously as an artist. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm not gonna do commercials. I'll only do like interesting acting stuff. But in order to get to interesting acting stuff, you have to just, like go on all these stupid auditions. And I mean, even performance making opportunities, I had like my mentor at CalArts who made her own work um, and was like a Latina theater artist was always like, I mean, she didn't say it overtly, but she was always kind of like, why don't you make stuff that's like more like Latina theater? And it's like, because like, I'm, I am, I'm just like doing it with like a different kind of material. Um, and yeah, I just hated going into audition rooms for material that I thought was really not that exciting. It just takes a lot of time to go into auditions. I didn't like having to look certain ways um doing plays can be fun but if you're not if, doing plays is super time consuming I mean you're like rehearsing every day and it's like in the service of somebody else's vision and I just wasn't interested in that honestly Janixa was my roommate in after college like I've, we've known each other since college she's one of my closest friends so every once in a while she'll make a movie or a short and she'll be like hey I have this role do you want to play it and I just like show up and do it like I don't have an agent or anything like my only professional gigs are just like my friend being like "Ugh, I just don't want to do a casting for this part can you just like come in and do it and then I'll do it um I mean listen if some amazing director wanted to like collaborate collaborate with me on a role that was like really interesting that sounds great I love performing I like acting I just think it's very time consuming if you're gonna do it for output that is just like cultural pollution <laughs> you know yeah totally I mean it, it that's one of the most interesting things I think about being and living in LA is that the kind of mysticism around the entertainment industry really dissolves and you see, like you do see all of those materials that go into making that magic image because you'll be driving around and they're shooting this show or they're shooting that show. But then there's like, everything else that's happening around it and I think there's definitely this misconception about being in LA that it's all about film and tv industry when it's not although it is very present um and it's very much there um it's funny because I feel like you can really kind of forget about it, like depending on like what your geography in the city is and then all of a sudden you'll like rub up against it it'll be like Oh yeah, I feel like that happens to me anytime I go to like West Hollywood or something. I'm like, oh, this is like a different Los Angeles than the one that I do my daily life in. Yeah, and then you're and then you enter into the TV set kind of yeah. in real time. Oh, wait, what's up, Sam? They were filming something recently around Harvard Square and it was really cool to see the way people reacted because they'd like transformed JP Licks into like a new place and they'd like changed the Harvard shops to have like vintage sweatshirts and stuff. And I'm like from close to LA. So I'm like, 
used to seeing stuff like that so, like okay on occasion and um, my roommates who are like from like Kentucky had like never seen anything like it so they'd like stop and look and it was really interesting to see the way people like reacted to it definitely to seeing that transformation that is so I mean it's striking it's kind of it can be really striking in a way that's like you don't it doesn't make sense that it should be so like, oh my God, like a thing is happening, but it yes. really is like kind of exciting that something can change from like truth to fiction in front of your very eyes uh, outside of a context of like, okay, we're going to like a theater performance space. Like when it enters into reality, it is like somehow like, wow, like that you can do that. Um, I mean, it's amazing how much, uh, what is that called? Object constancy. Mm. I mean, that's like what develops in your brain when you're, you know, however many months old, but object permanence, but that we kind of have this object permanence for entire structures and like building facades and people's bodies, like just getting a haircut is like a really big deal to other people <laughs> it's amazing actually <laughs> yeah. actually you know what you that you bring that up is interesting because I do remember one time walking into one of the Chinatown plazas in LA and they were filming what I learned later found out was like a like a um Ryan Gosling, like mob, 1930s mob movie or something. And, you know, it's like you walk under the arches and you're just like walking like to get your like, you know, sweet potato donut or whatever. And then all of a sudden it's like all these old cars and all this stuff and the like rice paddy hats. But then you remember, like you realize that, oh, actually like, all of these Chinatown facades were kind of built as a set when they relocated Chinatown from where it used to be to where it is now. So it's actually like serving its purpose. And what just, it, yeah, it just like kind of, it, it did a, a weird thing where I just like, I saw it as a set and then I like remembered it as a not set. And then I like saw the not set as a set before the set. It was like totally bizarre displacement. That's what I try to make with my performance. <laughs> I try to recreate that feeling. Well, thank you so much again. I think that's a great note for us to end on. Um, such a wonderful lecture and, and seeing that performative moment where you really, I mean, I was, <laughs> You guys know me, my jaw was on the floor. I was like, wow, there's gold, there's disco balls. Um, that was just such a great unexpected moment. And thank you so much for sharing also your studio space with us and like your family too. Um, this has been so wonderful. So let's unmute again and give Maria another round of applause. Thank you.